Hello and welcome to another amazing episode of 100 Yards of Football Sports Talk Radio. I'm your producer, Jeremiah Long, and joining me to talk about the University of Alabama Crimson Tide from 1920s all the way to 1970s is the man himself, the football encyclopedia, Mr. Vincent Turner. How's it going, sir? How you doing this morning, Jeremiah Long? How you doing, my man? Excellent, excellent. We are so excited to be here talking football. We got a new season coming in. We're going to be putting uh, our butts back in the stadiums. We're going to fill up these uh, fill up these arenas and fill up these stadiums all over the country. And I know there are a lot of really great Alabama fans who cannot wait to come and see some football right in front of their face again. So without further ado, let's get them hype. Let's get them ready. Mr. Turner, tell us what exactly – um, was happening with Alabama through the 1920s and 1970s that led up to them being such a powerhouse today? Well, Jeremiah, I want to say first when we get started, thank you because mm-hmm. you've been the guy that's done some outstanding work over the last two years. You got me to places that I could never even dream of, and I want to say thank you with much love and appreciation. Another reason I want you to be on this video today, because you can relate. See, me and you Southern guys, and we know a little bit about the Southeastern Conference and Alabama football because you grew up in Knoxville, which is on the eastern part of the state of Tennessee, on the western part of uh, Tennessee and Memphis. But we still got the same alliance because we love the Vols. So the day is special doing this video with you because I got somebody that understands what it means about football down in this country. But let me get it started, Jeremiah. Let me, let me take you back because you can relate to this. When we talk about Alabama football from the 20s and 70s, we got to start with the conference they play in, which is the Southeastern Conference. And when you look at the Southeastern Conference, it's a patch of ground. It's a state of emotion. And then think about the SEC now. And I don't mean to put people's names out there, but please forgive me. I still love y'all. When you look at the SEC, it's more top 10 teams every year. Barry Brown, I love you, brother. It's more All-Americans every year. I love you, brother Jonathan Simmons. And this is for you especially. He was a great player at Clemson. It's more pro players in the National Football League right now out of SEC, Mr. Dexter Davis. But when you look at the conference this Alabama tradition has played in over the years, it's been great. And then when you think about football in the South, now think about this correlation. I was born in 60. Jeremiah, what what year you was born in? 73, 74? 81. 81. I'm sorry, I'm off a little bit. But think yes. about this. Both of us still love Tennessee at a high level. Absolutely. Because we know this, Jeremiah, Mr. Long, looking good this morning, is that football in the South, it isn't a sport, man. It's a way of life. You're right. Can I say it one more time, my brother? It isn't a sport. It's a way of life. And then me, I'm going to take you back, Jeremiah. You can contest this because you've been to a lot of Tennessee games in your lifetime. But see, people of other parts of the country don't understand going to a game that's got an Alabama playing in the Southeastern Conference. I'm going to take you down to the 205. You're going to Birmingham and watch the Tide playing you tailgating. And you're smelling them grits with with that cheese in it, grits in your eggs. Then you're going over to Athens watching Georgia. 706, and you smell that pecan pie. Then you come into Knoxville. I've been to a lot of Tennessee games. And Jeremiah, you can help me out with this. My nephew graduated from the school in 2006. My sister attended in 80. Mm -hmm. I had three guys out of my neighborhood that played football. And what I love coming up there and watching the Tennessee game and tailgating, that good old fried chicken. That's salty ham. That good old buttermilk cornbread. See, yeah. people don't they don't understand that about the SEC. And then look at all the great players that's played in this conference. I'm going to go back in the day. Billy Cannon at LSU. Bruiser Kennard at Ole Miss. George Blander at Kentucky. Cotton Clark at Alabama. Dixie Howell at Alabama. Shorty Mac Williams at Mississippi State. Showboy Borkin at Ole Miss, Bo Jackson at Auburn, Herschel Walker at Georgia, Conrad Holloway at Tennessee, 
Mm-hmm. Say something about all that that I just brought up. And then finally, the team that got it started, Roll Tide, 1920. I'm going to start with each team great in that era mm-hmm. that the University of Alabama football history can tell us today. Let's go back to the 20 team. We're going to go back to the 1925 Rose Bowl. Alabama's first national championship. And back then, the Rose Bowl was the only bowl game. There were seven schools that you had to go out there. That was that was a game that was a national championship game. That Alabama team went out there and played a powerful University of Washington team that had George Wilson. And they came away with a 20 in 1950. But you know what's about that Alabama team? They was coached by a great coach in Wallace Wade. But I love that team, man. Dixie Howe, when I do my research. Oh, excuse me, not Dixie Howe. My man, Pulley Hart. I'm getting a little bit before myself. Outstanding mm-hmm. quarterback. And the movie star looks at Johnny Mac Brown. Coached by Wallace Wade, another great coach. Then I'm going to go into the 30s. Wallace Wade had stepped down. Frank Thomas comes over from Notre Dame. And he puts together a 1934 team that's got Dixie Howe, Don Hudson, Kay Francis, Bill Lee. And they go out there and beat that Stanford team 29 and 13. They had a pretty good player in the name of Bobby Grayson. But you know who else is on that team? The young man out of Arkansas, Bear Brown, was offensive. Team. Then we go to the 40s. The last great team under Frank Thomas. He had a guy that was out of Birmingham, Alabama. Remember I told you about going over there tailgating, going over getting some of them good eggs and grits and having cheese in them, then having – what I used to do, I used to have some of that good old sweet tea mm-hmm. with the lemons. But that 1945 team was special. Defensively, they only gave up, I believe, 40 points. But the offense rolled up 430 points. And they had that 150-pound guy, Harry Gimmer, that was doing his thing. But yeah. they had some guys on that team. Norwood Hodges, Hal Self, Jim Kane. Help me out, Jesus. Let's move on to the 50s. Coaches have changed. Harold Red Drew is in his sixth year. The 1952 Orange Bowl. Alabama puts up the greatest offensive explosion ever seen. They beat 72, 61 to 6. And boy, they finished 10 and 2 that year. But what's special about that team, they had a running back by the name of Bobby Milo. Mm-hmm. 950 yards. But they had other great players on their team. Tommy Lewis, Ed Culpepper. I love this name. Hootie Ingram played on their team. Alabama took a step back in the mid-50s under Brian Ears Whitworth. Had three losing seasons in the middle of the 50s. So you know that's not going to happen at Alabama. We're talking about excellence at its highest level. So what they did, they had to go back and bring the prodigal son home. From Arkansas. He had coached in Maryland, Kentucky, and he was at Texas AM. In 1958, mark this down if you're watching the video. This changed everything about college football in the University of Alabama of being where they are today on the Nick Saban. Brad Brand came home. And all I can say, football changed at the University of Alabama. 1961, in his fourth year, he won his first national championship. I was one year old, so I couldn't remember. But I remember when I got older, my father and my dad and my uncle told me that Alabama team was special. Yeah. That 61 team had star power. They beat Arkansas in the Sugar Bowl 10-3, to and Arkansas had a pretty good receiver who was a halfback that was an All-American, went by the nickname Bambi, by the name of Lance Allworth, that went on and had a great career with the San Diego Chargers out of Greenville, Mississippi. And they beat that Ole Miss team 10 to three. But them players on that team, think about it. Pat Tramble ended up becoming a doctor, later on died of cancer, but he was the guy that played quarterback that drove that team in 1961. When you're talking about unselfishness, smart and adaptable, that was what Alabama football became. Then he had Matt Moore, who ended up coming to AD. Charlie Pale, who ended up becoming the head coach at Clemson in Florida. Bill Battle, you know that name, Jeremiah, ended yeah. up becoming head coach at Tennessee. Richard Williams, 
ended up becoming home, head coach in my hometown in 901 at the time, Memphis State. Billy Neighbors and Tommy Booker. That 61 team set it out. Then the following year. This one really, I think, kind of star studded Alabama from coming becoming a school everybody was looking down. So because remember back in the 60s, there were really terrible, terrible civil rights issues that was going on in the state of Alabama. Yeah. And people view this country of Alabama different down there in Birmingham and the surrounding cities. But it changed in 1962 because this young man came on campus with a little more swagger, a little bit out of place, but he brought some from up north. And this is what really, I think, took Alabama to where they are today because of his presence. He came out of Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. Couldn't get in Maryland because of unfortunate circumstances. Recruited by Harold Scherenberger. But boy, he was special. And he went on and won a Super Bowl ring with the New York Jets. But when he got to Alabama, Tuscaloosa, and before he had the knee injury, he was one of the best athletes to ever play this game. Yeah. He wore the chinchilla coat in New York. He wore the baggy pants. He brought the swagger. The nickname, Joe Willie Namath. And he stepped on campus in Alabama that first year in 1962, and Alabama went 10 and 1. Would have won a national championship if they wouldn't have lost to Georgia Tech. How funny is that? 76 here in Atlanta. But boy, Alabama football just skyrocketed. Everything centered around Joe Namath. And could Paul Bear Bryant hold this guy in his place? Well, the next year, 1963, Alabama went nine and two. Joe Namath got suspended. He got caught drinking off campus. Steve Sloan backed him up, led Alabama to a bowl win. But then in 1964, Joe Namath was reinstated. The whole eyes of the country were on him. And boy, he was playing real well until he had a knee injury October the 10th against North Carolina State. Didn't even get hit. Still didn't change his draft status. But Alabama was still able to hold on under the guys of Steve Sloan quarterback out of Bradley Central, Cleveland, Tennessee, finest, ended up being the head coach at Ole Miss. Mm -hmm. They went on, won a national championship, and that was at the time they was voting national champions before the bowl games. But that night, 1965, Orange Bowl, the first night game telecast, Joe Namath came off the bench, 18, 37, 255 yards, two touchdowns. And, boy, he put on the show before 22 million. Alabama football skyrocketing. He graduated, but in 1965, I just mentioned the young man from Bradley Central, Cleveland, mm -hmm. Tennessee finest, former head coach at Vanderbilt in Ole Miss, Steve Sloan, took Alabama to another championship. What happened so ironic that year in 65? LSU upset Arkansas, who was rated higher than Alabama in the polls, and UCLA upset the number one Michigan State. And Alabama played Nebraska in the Orange Bowl that day. And Alabama put on a whooping, 39-28. Mr. Sloan completed 20 pass of 296 yards. And Alabama was rolling. But the next year, 1966, a lot of people saying this might have been the best Alabama team. And they had a young man from Redneck Riviera, from Foley, <laughs> Alabama. Kenny yeah. Snake Stable are leading the team with Ray Perkins, Les Kelly, and Dennis Holman. And he went through that schedule, and they blew out Nebraska in the 67 Sugar Bowl, 31-7, but they was denied the national championship. That year, you had the game of the century in November of 96, where you had Notre Dame and Michigan State, one and two. Both of them teams tied 10-10. That great Notre Dame team, they had Jim Lynch, Allen Page, Rocky Blyer, Terry Hanratty, the Michigan State team, who I would say is probably the most talented team that never won a national championship. Bubba Smith, Jimmy Ray, Gene Washington, George Webster, just outstanding talent. Both of them teams tied 10-10, but the polls still kept Notre Dame number one, Michigan State number two, Alabama number three. The reason, I think, because of the civil rights unrest we had down here in the South at the time, especially in the state of Alabama, and the funny thing, Notre Dame didn't even play in a bowl game that year, but they were still rated number one. 
that was a great Alabama team in 1966. And I always ask myself, a lot of Alabama people saying that 1966 team was the best ever in the history of college football. But I challenged myself. I would have loved, I was six years old at the time, and I did an interview on that 1966 Tennessee State team that I saw up close and personal. I would have loved to see that Alabama team play that Tennessee State mm-hmm. team. They had Eldridge Dickey, Claude Humphrey, Jimmy Marcellus, Albert Drango, and King Dunlap singing. I would have loved that in Bill Johnson. But let's move on. After that, times got kind of rough in the 60s. At the end of the 60s, Alabama went 6-5, six 6-5-1. and, five, six, five and one. Coach Brown was thinking about taking a job with the Miami Dolphins. People saying time had passed him. He was losing it at his head coach. But the 70s brought probably, outside what's happening right now at the University of Alabama, the greatest era in Alabama history as we wrap up the 70s and wrap up. Talking about the great university, the University of Alabama from the 1920s and 1970s. And to me, this saved Alabama football, the 1971 team. Very unrestful time. Brian, Coach Brown was catching a lot of flack, not recruiting African-American players. They held, opened up the 1970 season, got spanked by a mighty USC team led by, you know who, Sam the Bam, Cunningham, Jimmy Jones. But that 71 team was a change that needed to happen. And if I take anything away from Coach Brown, I admire him, I respected him, and I loved him. He was willing to change his whole offense, the gamble, in 1971. They went from a power eye offense to the wishbone. In the first game of the year in 1971, they upset USC. In Los Angeles, they still had the same Jimmy Jones. They had Charles Anthony. They had Charles the Tree Young, Sam the Bam Cunningham, and Lynn Swan. And they went up there and shocked the world and beat that USC team 17 to 10. And they went on that year, ended up going undefeated. One um, another game I remember, the end of 71, they beat a fine Auburn team that was ranked number two, two in the country, had the great Pat Sullivan. Ted Beasley enrolled on them in Birmingham 31 to 7. But got to the Orange Bowl, played a powerful Nebraska team, one of the best teams probably ever in college football. They had Jeff Kenny, Richard Glover, Larry Jacobson, the young man out of Omaha, Omaha North High School, Mr. Johnny Rogers, and Jerry Taggy out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. They ended up losing the Orange Bowl 38 to 6. But that Alabama team changed the course of the history where Alabama football is at today. Trust me, kudos to Robin Parkhouse, kudos to John Mitchell, kudos to Terry Davis, kudos to the Italian Stallion, Johnny Musso, kudos to Wilbur Jackson, kudos to Chuck Strickland, kudos to Lanny Norris, kudos to Steve Williams. Mm-hmm. That 1971 team changed it all for Alabama. Now, Jeremiah, I'm going to take you to 1973, the year that another special Alabama team, they won the national championship. They was voted number one to eight people. They lost the bowl game to a great Notre Dame team. Sugar Bowl, 24-23, one of the best games I've ever seen. But what was ironic about that year, Tennessee was powerful. We was in the top ten, baby. Ranked number five. We played Alabama at 11.30 on Saturday in 1973. And there was the game that I said, if Tennessee is able to beat Alabama, maybe the big orange to be talking about national championship in 73. That 73 team was special, Jeremiah. You know, it was on the team, Tommy West out of Gainesville, Georgia, baby. Country Tyler running the show. Stanley Morgan, Eddie Brown. And the game was tied 21 to 21 going in the fourth quarter. Tennessee had battled back from 21 to seven. And boy, I remember as clear as day, Skies blue. Keith Jackson, national television. And boy, in that fourth quarter, Tennessee pointed to a guy that was an outfielder on the baseball team named Robin Carey. And he took the punt back 64 yards up the middle for a touchdown. Alabama 28, Tennessee 21. Tennessee on the assuming possession in the fourth quarter goes three and out. Then Wilbur Jackson goes 80 yards. Game over. Alabama wins 42 to 21. That 73 season was special, man, for Alabama. And then getting back to the Notre Dame game, 
Alabama up. Got Notre Dame pinned down inside their one-yard line, about two minutes to go and some change. And Notre Dame probably at that time completed the best play in college football history. Tom Clemens goes back on this one-yard line in his zone and hits Robin Weber for a 36-yard game. And Notre Dame ends up beating Alabama 24-23. Moving on to the 70s, we're going to move on to 1978. My freshman year at the University of Arkansas, mm -hmm. Alabama's got probably one of the best teams in the country. That 78 season, they rolling. First two games of the year, they beat Nebraska. They had Ian Hemp, Junior Miller, Rick Burns, a good out Nebraska team, 20 to 3 in the opening game. They beat a Missouri team that year. They had Kellen Winslow Sr., Philip Bradley that went on and played with the Seattle Mariners, first round pick, mm -hmm. and James Wildner, who did his thing with Tampa Bay. They beat that Missouri team. Then they beat Washington that year that had Joe Steele and Tom Flick. But they end up losing to a mighty, mighty pile for USC team in Birmingham in that season. The USC team that had Charles White, Paul McDonald, Ronnie Lott, mm -hmm. Dennis Smith, John Villa, outstanding football team. Excuse me, not John Villa, Anthony Munoz, getting them mixed up with the offensive tackles. Ended up losing that game 24 to 14, but Alabama regrouped. Went through the SEC undefeated, but the game of the year was the 1979 Sugar Bowl against a mighty Penn State team that had Matt Miller, Bruce Clark, Mike Goldman, Scott Frisky. And that game ended up 14 to 7. Alabama won a real close, tough football game. And what I take out of that 79 Sugar Bowl was that Alabama defense that had Marty, Marty Lyons, Barry Krause. Dan McNeil, E.J. Jr., Wayne Hamilton, Curtis McGriff, Rich Wingo. Mm -hmm. And that fourth down stand, when Mike Gooman went over the top and Barry Krause, who was the first-round pick of the Baltimore Colts, went up, and they went up in midair like two rams. He stopped Gooman one yard shot short of a touchdown, and then he knocked himself out. Had to take smell and sauce, and he ran off the field. And that Alabama crowd went crazy. And all you can hear is And another play from that game, a young man who scored the first touchdown was out of Memphis by the name of Bruce Bolton that played wide receiver, 901, just representing. But Alabama had won the national championship, split it with USC that year, and Paul Bell Bryant being carried off the field. Then coming back in the 1979 season, another great team, and that Alabama team repeated. But what I loved about that 79 team, the quarterback was special. Out of Dalton, Alabama, Stepman Sheila, and he ran that wishbone to court. And I like who he had in the backfield, Major Ogilvy, Billy Jackson, Steve Whitman. But that defense had took it up another notch. They still brought back Dan Mc, Don McNeil, Curtis McGriff, Warren Lyles, Brian Braggs, Thomas Boyd was playing then, Jim Bob Harris, Tommy Wilcox was coming up, coming off the bench as a, as a freshman. That team was special. They ended up run, rolling through the schedule. Ended up playing the school that I was at at the time of sophomore, the University of Arkansas, beating them in the Sugar Bowl 24-9. And that Arkansas team, Kevin Scanlon, Gary Anderson out of Columbia, Missouri, they ended up playing with the Tampa Bay Bandits and USFL San Diego Chargers. Billy Ray Smith, San Diego Chargers, finest true freshman on that team. A guy that was outstanding defensive tackle, Richard Richardson, that passed here recently. Outstanding football player, Ozzy Riley, Teddy Morris at the linebacker position, Kevin Evans, Trent Bryant, Robert Farrell, Bobby Duckworth. Arkansas beat that team 24 to 9. Mm. And what I take away from the 70s, I think everybody that's an Alabama fan now, once you watch this video today, you need to go research the 70s. Because in the 70s, Burr Brown won eight SEC championships. He won 103 games. And he won three national championships. 
I know there's going to be an argument that Nick Saban is the greatest, but people you need to stand back and look what this man did. And in 1971, he stood up like a man should do. He changed his offense. He went from a pro style to a wishbone. And the rest is history with University of Alabama football. Well, it's been great talking about this great school, this great university. I still love the Vols to the end of the, to when I when I talk about Alabama. Now I'm still a big Orange fan. I don't want nobody to get a misunderstanding here, but I got a lot of respect for the University of Alabama and yes, what they're yes. doing over there in Tuscaloosa. It's unreal. So. I'm going to end the show today. As I let you get the get the word, I'm, I'm going to end the show today and you're going to come behind me. When I think about the University of Alabama, I want to get a name right. I think about Alanda Myers. She had a song out called Black Velvet. And when I think about Alabama football, I think Mississippi in the middle of the day, Dry Spell, Jimmy Rogers on the Victoria. And all I can think is black velvet and the old southern smile. Do you miss me? I don't mean it much. Football in the South, it isn't a sport. It's a way of life. Jeremiah, you have the floor. Yeah. That, that is, okay, so I'll tell you this. Mr. Turner, Mr. Football, football encyclopedia himself, when we go through each of these eras, it's much clearer and easier to see why a team like Alabama is not just dominant today, is not just been dominant for a few years, but has this legacy of dominance that you can see going forward for the next 20, 50 years. And that's because of the, this legacy, of these amazing teams, and of all of the players and coaches who have put these teams together and have made history and made this legend. Um if I were to put one more question to you, it'd be out of all as the 1920s through the 1970s, who, what was the most influential era? Well, Jeremiah, I'm going to say this from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I would have to say the 60s mm. because I'm not going to go there today with the video because we got so much good information. But you know that was happening down in Birmingham. There was a lot of unrest throughout the, throughout the country, but especially in that part of the state the section of the state. And this is no really shine. I'm not trying to shine bad here on the state of Alabama, but I would have to say the sixties simply because Alabama was the cream of the crop. And we're talking about football powers in the sixties. You had all the unrest with George Wallace. I'm not going to go there, but I think the biggest thing was him being able to sign African-American football players, which he did in 1970 with Wilbur Jackson and John Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And that 71 team becoming very successful. I think it changed the whole outlook of how football is played in the South. Because back then, the African-American athlete wasn't going to Southern schools. Right. And really, when you look at it, I think the 60s is the most interfering era of my time. It changed everything about football. It changed everything about relationships. Because Alabama was the cream, it was the king, it was the top of the mountain. And they had a figure, Bear Bryant, that was greater than God in the state of Alabama. Yeah. Let's talk about all the old people that all the old fans back in the day and how he was respected. The Sixers to me is the most important part in Alabama football history. And you can take them getting beat by USC in the opening game, but to me. It's when they start bringing the African American players in. John Mitchell, Webber Marshall, Woodrow Lowe, Ozzy Newsom, Willie Shelby, Sylvester Croom, Dwight Stevenson, Don McNeil, Tony Nathan. Yeah. That's when it changed. Mike Washington. That's when it changed to a high level. Out of Nashville, EJ Jr., Brian Braggs. Curtis McGriff, Thomas Boyd, Jeremiah Castillo. Yeah. That's when Alabama football changed, when the African-American player became part of the scene. And that's all I have to say. It's been well, great doing this video. 
Yeah, you cannot go wrong there. Well, everybody watching, please join us every day because we have got new podcasts, new um, history specials, new team previews, interviews with a great uh, coaching staff, former players, current players, and we've got Vincent Turner, our football encyclopedia. So if there's anything that you'd like to see, especially in history specials, or anything about the game, then just please drop it in the comments, send us a message, go to our website, hit us up on our podcast, which is 100 Yards of Football, and we are so excited and so grateful that you are with us and that you've been with us for all this time. Um, one of the quick things I was going to show you, like um, our podcast is like blowing up. I don't know if I told I haven't told you because I haven't told, uh, talked to you this morning, Mr. Turner, but we've had over 900 downloads this month on our podcast, which is a new record for us. And we just want to see keep going. Yeah. So please uh, um, share our videos, share our podcast, and just tell your friends and family about 100 Yards of Football. And if you really enjoy our show, then make sure you subscribe, like, and uh, continue to uh, join us each week for brand new episodes. All right. For the entire team, I am hey, Jeremiah uh, and Vincent Turner. What's up? Yeah, I want to say one more thing before we end, yeah. and I'll be wrong. If I don't give credit, first of all, credit to you for putting me in a level that I never thought. But of most of all, my heart goes out and he knows I love him like a brother. I wouldn't be the man of the day doing this. Two special people. One, Ronnie Keebler, my business partner out of Brooklyn, New York. Much love, man. Thank you for hanging in there with me and believing in me. And Mark Bass out of Lufkin, Texas. Brother, I love you. Thank you for all your support and your love that you've shown me. And to the whole staff of 100 Yards Football, it's a great day in the neighborhood. We got football, what, coming up in September? Don't worry about the pandemic. It's going to go back to being normal. As I said before, Jeremiah, and you should know this, in the South, football is, isn't a sport. It's a way of life. Right. You are right. All right. Well, everybody keep watching. We'll be back with another live episode of 100 Yards of